advertisement of gaming and messaging. So what happened is that uh, after the authority and BCLB had uh, you know, discussed the issues, we have the view that whatever guidelines they had in terms of guiding the gaming and uh, lotteries uh, was in conflict with our programming code. The programming code defines what we call a watershed period and watershed period is that period during which uh, content that is not in intended, uh, uh, I mean, the content that is, uh, is not to be broadcast that uh, between uh, 5 a.m. and 10 p.m. So content of adult nature. And unfortunately, the acts and the regulations, the broadcasting regulations, as well as the court, uh, does not have any white gaming. So, it's not properly, it's not defined. It was looking more of uh, inappropriate material, more for violence, more for something pornographic and all that. But we, we you and me, uh, you know, there is a problem uh, with gaming uh, in terms of it becomes very addictive and it has uh, uh, some of the effects that uh, is, is not uh, uh, um, appropriate. But interestingly, the case that is before um, Constitutional and the Human Rights uh, Court, in the High Court, is that it is a young person who actually went to court. The cha chairman of uh, Kenya University Students Organization. And the argument is uh, they went to court when we had uh, convinced BCLB to change the guidelines so that they, re they are reviewed to not to allow any gaming or betting advertisement or programs between in the, during the watershed periods uh, because it's still illegal but I mean it's legal but if that could be pushed outside the period when you know children are likely to be watching programs and that's uh, when the matter uh, went to court uh, the court has not ruled on it it's still pending there so there are many actors one of the actors is uh, of course the authority uh, for us uh, uh, I mean, we are an institution that is governed by law and we implement the law to the letter. And uh, anytime there are many things that we, the authority does, if we are not, is not within the law, uh, the media uh, is very litigious, they move to court. So that's one of the areas, so already uh, the matter is in court. But secondly, we are engaging uh, an other multi-agency um, approach one of those institutions, there is the Media Council of Kenya, uh, there is the Kenya Film Classification Board, which is very key in this because they are the only ones who are mandated by law to classify uh, content. So uh, that content of gaming and lotteries uh, is yet to be properly classified, and especially on radio. So that's what they are working on. They are at that stage where that, uh, they have come up with some guidelines uh, which are going out for public consultation and I'm sure uh, in the next few weeks uh, they'll be inviting the public to give the comments so that when that now becomes, uh, uh, they are approved and they become law, then now the authority uses that because in our act it recognizes the role of KFCB to classify content. And if KFCB classifies specific content to be outside the watershed period, then we implement it to the letter and will not allow. And so that's one of the areas that uh, there are issues, of course, there is the Media Council of Kenya, there is the BS, BCLB itself uh, looking at the issues of uh, the licensing so that uh, then they don't license something that uh, will then bring problems. So it's a matter that is active, but also it's being litigated. Uh, but we believe that when these multi-agencies uh, come with a, uh, you know, um, a joint decision, a decision on the same, uh, the issue of uh, betting on radio and uh, TV uh, will be solved. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. But Meski Aksema, adult content. I think we are going to have a conversation, a whole conversation around that. Uh, Fiona, I understand you are in, the, in our midst, and as the technology service provider, how are you uh, facilitating your members uh, to, 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 to grow and how are your members protecting consumers in this era of innovation and technology? I hope Fiona, you are in the house. So thank you, Mao. Come here.
and you should clap for this lady. She looks wild. All right, welcome. Thank you so much. Sorry I'm late. I was uh, at a clash of meetings based on the where the program went to be, but I'm here. Uh, what has TESPOP done to facilitate uh, members' uh, growth and support of consumers within the digital space? One of the things that TESPOP does, and this is pretty much behind the scenes because you never get to deal with us as a consumer, but you deal with our members. We run and manage shared infrastructure that the service providers use. And one of the things that this infrastructure does is it makes the speed of your communication faster. When I'm talking to people, I normally tell them the reason why you do not often see the circle going round, downloading, is because of what we do at TESPOC, and that is because of the Kenya Internet Exchange Point that reduces the speeds of communication from uh, 100 and above milliseconds to as low as 15 milliseconds. And this happens because all the service providers who carry the digital traffic are present at the exchange point. When they come and drop their traffic there and those who are picking it for the different customers pick it from there, it, it fastens the speeds of communication. I was actually surprised today when the um, governor talked about 10, sec 10 seconds is 10,000 milliseconds. <laughs> And for him to be comfortable with a speed of 10,000 milliseconds, while at KXP, service providers are giving you speeds of maximum, if there is an issue, will be 50, 70 milliseconds. It means that we are really on very different uh, plans in terms of the customer and service delivery to the customer. But that also means that a lot of the, the digital service providers are not allowing the ISPs to bring them into the exchange. Because if they did that and they came and took up the ports at the exchange and they are able to handle the traffic there, because what it does is it keeps the local traffic local. That means your traffic is not going to, you're not, first of all, you're not hosted on a .com, you're on a .ke that is present at the exchange point. And that means that your resolution on the .ke is much faster. You're on a .com, of course, kutakuwa na your delay. So the, the, it takes a bit more time. Then the service providers you're using are the service providers who are the digit, who own infrastructure and can get you directly into the exchange. Because we also have middlemen companies in between that don't own any infrastructure, but come to offer services as if they owned infrastructure, and, but they don't have infrastructure. So ideally they're supposed to be handling content and so they have a license from the CA for content. But when they sell to you the package, they try to bundle everything so that as a customer you get a value add. But if you're offering critical services, then you need to let your service providers know that my service is critical, I want the speeds to be at this level. The service providers know the solution, they will know how to sort you out. While still helping you manage your content, they'll be able to get you in at speeds that are much faster. So that is one of the things we do. The other thing we do is to also protect the consumer is we manage, the, we work with the service providers to manage the integrity of the network, cyber security. Because if we don't do that, so the first, the first point of cyber security incidences will be your service provider. But before sometimes even these issues get to the service providers, we can see the trends at the exchange points, who's been targeted, who's been likely to have an issue, and we begin to work with the technical teams early so that they can be able to begin to address issues before they happen. We work very closely with the KESAT, where we report on an hourly, daily, as in 24-7-365, on incidences that are happening that we are seeing on the networks of the service providers. But of course, we, as TESPOC, we also have a responsibility as part of our mandate to make sure the investor, the owner of the network knows. So we spend a lot of time with the engineers and the teams on the ground to clean up the networks, to address the issues, to make sure that the customers are protected. Though sometimes we've noticed the customers are very difficult <laughs> to, 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 to give services to because some customers have uh, want to do very interesting things on the networks, what I, what I call abuse of technology. 
And when you abuse the technology, sometimes you'll ask the service provider, please get that customer off the network because they are seemingly targeting other networks and targeting networks that are doing certain activities that is critical for our economic uh, well-being. Yes. All right, quite elaborate there. Um, and I want to go now to our big fish from the Central Bank of Kenya. There are quite a number of complaints that have been raised by consumers on fintech and uh, we want to know, or consumers would like to know, do you handle consumer uh, complaints? What mechanisms do you have to handle consumer complaints? And do you engage with consumers directly too? They would like to know that so that tomorrow we may not queue at uh, Central Bank all of us. Or is there a way you handle those uh, complaints? We want, uh, consumers would want to know that. Uh, and uh, many of these complaints are on fintech, uh, uh, they are, they are, they are, the devices being hacked, those are some of the complaints we are getting as consumer organizations. They say that my phone was hacked and my information was taken, or my phone was hacked, and my social media platform has been used to solicit funds from people. So how do you handle uh, such a complaint? Do you engage with consumers directly? Yes, um, thank you for that question. And just before I go there, I just want to clarify what the sister here said about um, when governor accepted a solution that was taking 10 seconds to complete. And remember he started that when these people first came, it was like, what did he say? That was something like 100. And uh, it's that issue of balancing, um, uh, or rather, balancing innovation and, and expectations, yes? Trying to bring in the best in class. Now, we know not everybody who is smart enough to come up with an app that can do um, a financial transaction has a lot of muscle behind them. But you did hear uh, Michael, the director, say we hold them to the same standard, yes? And sometimes we want to encourage the youth to develop and innovate. And we're not saying as a regulator that because you don't match uh, the big boys, we're going to reject you. So that is a form of encouragement. But once we have them on board, we continue to challenge them to improve on that product. And we, we challenge everyone, even the ones who are very big. So I think that's where that comment came from. Uh, the other thing I want to say, Alice, is the average consumer is not in this room. And will never come to this room. They will never have the capability of participating. Uh, where I sit at the central bank, um, especially when um, Companies come in, maybe they want to, they are applying to be a, a licensed PSP. And I show them the people who are working outside. You know where Central Bank is, it's on Hills and last year Avenue. So we've got a sea of people moving back and forth. Some of them are going to railways to catch their matatus um, which are around railways. Others are going to Marikiti and others onwards to come back. To us, we say that is the customer. That is the real end customer of digital financial services. Yeah. When you look at the scale in which those people transact, if you think even of the free P2P tariffs, uh, person to person, it is free for people who send up to 100 shillings. Now, not many of us in this room often send 100 shillings. So you can imagine what the consumer looks like to us. And um, for, for us as a regulator, when you bring in your solution, as soon as you start to engage us and talk about it, we're now thinking of the consumer. Yes, your solution is very nice, it's very shiny, it is top of the range, People will tell us our company is in this, that, and other countries, or our company is listed on the 
London Stock Exchange, and all of these other things, which are valid, but at some point they might be irrelevant to what we are discussing. We are thinking of our local consumer. How is this solution going to impact him or her? Do they really need it? How are they going to learn how to use the technology that you are introducing? How are they going to get their complaints resolved? How will they know where to go to when they have a problem, which is the question you're asking me. And very similar to the gentleman from cybersecurity, some of the things you said, I don't know myself where I am supposed to go to report some of those issues. Uh, but the truth is that when people have hit a brick wall, they do come running back. They will write and say, central bank or dear governor, I sent money to a wrong person and uh, I called the service provider and they said they will resolve it within 10 days. Now a month has passed and I've not gotten my 1,000 shillings back. And every single communication that we receive, um, if, the te if the telcos were here, they would tell you, we write to them and we say, find attached this consumer complaint and whereas we may not want to go into the detail, we'll ask the telco to report back how it was resolved. Not just that it is resolved, but how it was resolved. Because then this gives us an indication of it was something you could have done when this consumer reached out to you, but you didn't. Because maybe it's a small person or it's a small amount of money according to them. And so we do, and we give that time frame and it is tracked. So if we say respond within uh, seven days or 14 days and you don't, we will send a follow up. So it is true and I know uh, the gentleman earlier was asking about whether we have a director for consumer protection, you have also raised it and governor was insisting the work itself is done. The title of the position or the office maybe is not there, but the work is definitely done. So as regulators, it is our responsibility, not just our mandate. It is our core responsibility to make sure the end consumer is protected and to make sure that that end consumer, the ones who are not in this room, understand the contents that even we're trying to discuss today. Yes, and it is broken down for them in a way that they understand it. It is put out, that this information is put out on media or media that they can reach and hear. So for example, I asked myself, actually, how come I don't know where to report in case my email is taken over? Maybe that's something to think about. How, how do you communicate this to the public? So I think in answer, that is my my response, and uh, we are government, we are civil servants, and it is our job, yes, to, to take care of the public. Well, thank you so much, and um, uh, I, two things uh, you've mentioned there. One, uh, it's your responsibility to ensure that that common person is protected, and uh, number two, you follow any complaint to the latter, which is very key. But maybe on behalf of consumers, because we are in consumer protection, uh, they would also want to know how to get that information there. Because if there's a contact, is with email address, you can just share it out before they start asking questions kindly. Yes, so um, we do have, and I will have to check what it is, we have a common, a common um, email address, which, which Anyone who is trying to contact Central Bank for anything and they don't know which department, it would go to communications. Yes, communications, I believe, at Central Bank, Tiolo, KE. Now, the team that is sitting there, headed by Wallace, are then the ones who distribute to each of the various uh, departments. Um, you know, so that if it's something to do with digital payment or something to do with um, MNOs, for example, it would then be routed to me. But we also have those who who write letters, um, 
we receive this written, we do receive some people walk in uh, to Central Bank. Um, so in whatever form, what I want to guarantee is that when we receive a letter, not only a complaint, a query, a question, it might even have nothing to do with our institution, we will respond. I right, thank you so much. And for those who cannot be able to reach out to Madame, maybe you can come to consume organizations. Uh, we will help you because our mandate is to ensure that consumers are educated. And one way to get that information is by telling you that there's this email address that you can use to communicate to Central Bank of Kenya. Let's clap for these wonderful people as we open up the flow for consumers to ask questions. Uh, you people, you've done me proud. You've done us proud. I was almost sleeping, but now here we are. Um, I don't know who is going to um, help us with the mic. Me? Yeah, okay, thank you so much. Oh, we will have two from this side and two from this side. And uh, direct a question to any one of us here we will respond. So, where do we go first? Who has a question? This is your time. We say today is the World Consumers Rights Day. So it's your day. Who has a question? We have one there, behind there. Oh, kindly, uh, if you could stand, you say your name and where you come from, as in, if it's an organization now, uh, you're a student, it's okay. So, good afternoon, guys. Good uh, afternoon. My name is John Mwange. I represent the county government of Mombasa, IT department. And my question is this. Uh, uh, this is to direct it to the Central Bank of Kenya. Um, what happens if the central bank get hurt? Uh, do we have something like a backup scenario in a case where, okay, uh, let me give this example. Uh, around the year 2016, the Bank of Bangladesh was hacked and some huge amount of money was transferred from it. So I'm asking if, for example, we, we encounter that scenario because in the line of technology, nobody uh, it's safe enough. Even if you're telling us we are so safe, we cannot, you cannot assure us that we are 100% safe. So I'm asking, in the event where maybe our government is hacked or something, do we have that uh, check in place whereby our money or the taxpayer's money is safeguarded? And another thing, uh, just on the same uh, case, I was asking this, uh, Unfortunately, I don't know if there's anyone who can answer this because it's directly to Safaricom. I was asking, uh, Safaricom uh, is a, I understand it's an governmental, it's a parastatal sort of a thing. So if uh, M-Pesa broke down for a day and we, we all store our money, or most of the Kenyans transfer our money uh, online, like through M-Pesa, is there also a backup like for M-Pesa? If, if today M-Pesa broke down and nobody is access to maybe mob, uh, banking accounts and stuff, do we, is, is there in any way that the central bank can assure Kenyans that we can get our money back? Thank you. All right, thank you. That's one. Uh, I think the first question would go to Madame, uh, Madame Anita and the other one will go, maybe Fiona will help us answer that. And then another person with a question. Anyone with a question? I saw another hand right in the middle. All right, this side. Dina is almost. Don't worry. Just ask questions. Dina is almost. All right. Let us respond. Let us get the responses on that. And if there's any panelists that would like to chip in, you are free to do that. Let's go, uh, Tina. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
I think uh, Central Bank is just like any other institution. And we have not just one system, but a number of systems uh, which could be targeted um, for, for attack. Now, the 2016 Bank of Bangladesh heist was a wake-up call for all central banks around the world. But more importantly, it was a wake-up call to the SWIFT, um, which is the SWIFT uh, company, which is based in, in Europe, to start introducing much more security around that payments network uh, or the messaging system that they have. And ever since 2016, it has been a continuous journey of upgrading, introducing new features, introducing transaction monitoring, um, risk, uh, risk controls within the SWIFT network. And this is a global, um, a global initiative. Now, when it comes to central bank, for example, and I want to believe this of all institutions and all government agencies, uh, you can be hacked through your IT network, you can be hacked through your email messaging uh, system, uh, you could be hacked through your HR system, uh, if you have a clinic, you could be hacked through your clinic uh, system and all of those um, are vulnerabilities. Now just like the standards that we hold our PSPs to and our banks for that matter uh, about having uh, to, to demonstrate that they have disaster recovery in place, that they have business continuity plans that are in place, that those plans are actually tested and activated on a regular basis and reported back, back to the regulator to ensure that they are up and working. And other controls, including AML, KYC, etc. Now, definitely, as the regulator, we would not be asking our licensees uh, to have those controls in place if we ourselves did not have the same in place. So um, it's an absolute guarantee that um, we do have business disaster recovery. We have, <clears throat> just like any other big institution, uh, data centers here and there. Uh, we do have uh, diverse um, business continuity controls for different systems and for different teams. And remember when the pandemic started, some of these had to kick into place. Nobody ever knew. Um, how to, how to manage a situation where people can't even go to work. Yes, but we managed to continue that quite smoothly. So um, I think that is just to give you the guarantee that the very best of controls are in place, but everybody remains vulnerable in one way or another. So it is more important to keep on testing your systems, uh, testing your, and, and not, not always planned tests, you can even just do very abrupt tests to make sure that your staff is all also on point. Thank you. Well, thank you, my sister Fiona. Okay, I'll speak for Safaricom because they are members of Tesco, the association, and only on the based on the general information that uh, we have at Tesco. Safaricom is not a public company uh, in the sense of a government parastatal. It is a public listed company that is, uh, sells its shares on the stock exchange, which means that you and I can be owners of Safaricom if you go and buy shares. That is what basically, when we say Safaricom is a public company, that is what we mean. It is not a parastatal. So that's just for correction. Every business today in the digital age is pretty much doing what uh, my colleague has just mentioned, ensuring business continuity. And as part of business continuity, there is nobody who's going to run their business with only everything centered in one place, unless you're a fresh startup and they're just starting, so you're trying to build as you show a backup, but you'll always have a backup plan with one of your service providers who handles the most critical part of your service. So within Safaricom, they do have backups of, for business continuity, and it's not just about M-Pesa, it's even the voice systems, you know, even those get hacked, they can be hacked, as we've seen in other markets. 
It's the data that goes through, all that can be hacked. So everything can be hacked that is on technology platforms. But companies have a standard where they are able to ensure that business is able to run seamlessly as much as possible. There have been times when we've seen uh, issues arising and, and I know that all members of Chessbook have put in. And sometimes you have worked even through the weekend with them, over Saturday right through Sunday to make sure things are working and systems are up as fast as possible. And one of the things that we need to appreciate that Kenya has that many countries in our part of the world don't have is the National Cyber Security Coordination Committee that of which Central Bank is uh, one of the members of the committee. So it brings together various uh, government organizations that we as private sector felt were critical to help us coordinate with them when there were cyber attacks. And the reason was there would be attacks and we go in, we try to reach out and someone is asking, who are you? How do you have that information? Where do you get it from? There is no time to answer all those questions and to write long, long red letters. We want to address the attack quickly in as fast a way as possible. So we needed coordination at the national level and uh, the Ministry of Interior was kind enough to co put together that, uh, that uh, group of uh, committee and it has brought in the security agencies, the Ministry of Defense, crit critical institutions, including the Communication Authority who are our regulators. And that enables us as private sector then to have an easy way of addressing issues and you'll begin to see some changes in our space. Because for the longest time, even when we have these crimes and things that are targeting customers and infrastructure is disrupted, we have not had a way of making sure that the culprits are brought to book properly. So as TESPO, one of the things we are actually doing is uh, working with this committee of the Cyber Security Coordination and we are putting in place a system because of the judiciary are there, the public prosecution are there. We are working with them to develop guidelines. You will discover what the law says and what it is. Because some of the crimes, you actually need to go to jail for 20 years. But uh, because of lack of awareness and lack of clear guidance, the law hasn't been implemented properly. So we are working on a system to make sure that happens and you'll be able to see that we are then able to put culprits through the entire process and that should make life much easier for all the service providers offering different services as well as me and you as the consumer. This business where you find someone na tunenda kotini na kwa ni kama mchezo wapaka na panya, itaisha. Why? Because sometimes the issue begins with the way the prosecution happens. The charge sheets are not written properly, so we, we have to do awareness to the uh, police officers, to the prosecutors, so that they understand the different uh, uh, crimes within the computer misuse and Cybercrime Act, for example, within the Kenya Communications Act, so that then they are able to uh, act appropriately and put the right uh, offenses on the charge sheet so that then we are able to see a difference because we want to actually working as an industry, working with every all the different regulators who are part of that uh, committee, we hope that we can make uh, a better uh, environment for the digital users. Well, thank you so much for that and uh, I did know that uh, Safaricom was your member. Um, uh, key uh, things that have uh, come out uh, from what you said is that uh, we need to invest in innovation. Number two, we need to create awareness. Awareness creation has been talked about since morning up to now. So we can go home less assured that what we're supposed to do as people tasked in our own companies and consumer protection department is that we ensure that we create awareness on consumer protection. The best way possible that consumers can be protected. They are coming out very, very strongly. Uh, before uh, we do our closing uh, remarks, is there anyone, okay, you can pass the mic to the fourth row. 
H? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon again. Good afternoon. Uh, my, my name is uh, Lance Mali, uh, Chairman of uh, RBC, Registered uh, Rights of Digital Comrades. And uh, my question goes to the CEO of uh, CDA, Consumer Downtown Association, Mr. Javed. Um, how do you protect uh, consumers uh, who are in Kenya uh, working with, um, with companies registered abroad and companies which don't have um, registered offices in Kenya? And um, the second question also goes to you. Um, is it okay or is it legal to work with um, with the companies registered abroad with the service level agreements based on a foreign law and the work is being done in our country. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jeff, if you can take up that. Uh, chairman of uh, uh, digital digital caps, I believe. Uh, well, I think uh, your question, the two questions, uh, are a bit specific. Uh, you're talking about companies that are, are, are not existing in our in our country, but they they have services that are happening here. I, I believe uh, you are referring to the Ubers. We have uh, this tax by the Uber and the rest, where they have uh, their regional companies in other countries, but they operate here. I think what is important here to note is that uh, uh, there are specific regulations that control such sectors in Kenya that have, they have because such companies have to comply with. And this is a conversation that we, we had uh, actually with you that we need to take it to another level of coming up with clear uh, regulations on how the drivers and uh, consumers and even Kenyans that are employed by foreign companies can get protected properly because there's a big gap in terms of uh, uh, how their rights are being infringed. And, and, and there's very, very little to do with, the, uh, with their protection because if you look at the, the services that they offer, vis-a-vis -vis the income they get is completely, uh, uh, I mean, is not really uh, uh, appropriate. Because I, I think a lot of us have seen, uh, you know, the Uber people demonstrating in most cases. Uh, the commissions are very, very little. And this is something that I think we are going to take it to another level so that we, we are able to address this issue. Uh, through, first of all, legal frameworks that will enable them to be able to work in a conducive environment that also recognizes uh, their roles and their rights as, as workers in this country. And then two, I, I also want to mention that uh, there is a, there's been a process of trying to come up with, a, uh, with an act that is seeking to address uh, the anomalies and issues within that sector. And this is where we are going to pick it up and engage with the right, right stakeholders to be able to complete this process of, of uh, uh, policy formulation. There was, uh, uh, outside that, there was something I wanted to raise. I don't know whether I can raise it now. Uh, out of the conversation that came up from the central bank, I think uh, it, I will be doing unfair business to consumers if I don't mention it here. A lot of Kenyans today are listed on CRP. A lot of Kenyans today are denied financial services, uh, access to financial services because of one reason or the other. They are listed in CRB. Some of them, maybe they are, they are not able to, uh, uh, to so sort out the, uh, their, their financial uh, credits and whatever. But myself, I've been a victim of uh, a wrong listing where one of the banks, which I don't want to mention their name, listed, my, listed me 
uh, for for somebody's loan that that I didn't have any knowledge about. So when I actually followed up, I wrote to the central bank. I, I first of all I wrote to the branch, my branch manager, and uh, and they didn't respond. Then the the second letter I wrote to central bank. When I wrote to them, now I copied uh, the bank, the branch and the headquarters of that bunch, bank, bank, then they responded. But then they were still insisting that I, 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 I guaranteed that person. And I told them, no, I, I don't even know that person, and, and I don't even belong to that branch. Uh, so there was no way I could be having a branch in this town, and then I go guarantee somebody in another, another town. So when the investigations were done within a week or so, they were, they were able to establish that it was a wrong listing and they had to remove me from CRP because of that. But then they didn't apologize because I was seeking another redress to, to uh, you know, asking them to apologize. But let me ask you, uh, from that scenario, I know there are so many consumers here who are listed wrongly and they are not aware. So many of them, maybe it was a mobile money transaction or rather it was a banking uh, listing or whatever it is but they have no means of getting to know whether it was the right listing or not, and they cannot access central bank, and some of them are right down at the village at Kilifi, they have no idea of doing an email, making a call, and getting this, and they cannot access anything to do with the central bank. How are we going to help these people? Uh, because today, you look at over 2 million today, over 2 million Kenyans are listed on CRB. And this is, these are the low-income consumers uh, who are the people who propel this economy. If we don't empower the, the Mamamboga, if you list Mamambogas, they are not going to access even the simple loans that we get access through mobile phones. And when they are not working anything, you don't expect even Mbogas to be produced from these uh, uh, lo local chambers. So first of all, Central Bank must come down to tell us very clearly how are we going to take this matter forward. And then there, there's, there has to be a clear mechanism on how we are going to address complaints arising from consumers. You, you, you did mention that uh, you ask banks how they, how, they, how they solve the issue. But then how are the consumers uh, part of that process? For instance, we have consumer organizations that also help advance those issues to, to the central bank. Is there a mechanism or a way that we can create a platform for consumers to complain, to bring issues? You know, people don't complain sometimes because they don't even know how to start. Yeah, so I think uh, uh, from where we sit, it is important that uh, uh, where you are, first of all, check if you are on CRB and start to find out how you got in there. And, and that perhaps might trigger more questions and even conversation that can take us to another level, that can give us a solution on how to address this matter. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Afet. Uh, and Madam, uh, maybe we were not able to talk to the central bank governor by that time. I think now we can send you you talk to him and you tell him that consumers need that department. We don't want to know the name that you'll use, but you want to, the consumers want to have a section where they will feel accommodated so that such issues can be addressed. So thank you so much. I know I'm going to give you on your closing remarks, you're going to uh, maybe respond. But before we close, I would like to ask Bwana uh, Ambani, uh, do you call him Rogers? Uh, Rogers, uh, what are the strategies from the CA? What are the strategies uh, uh, you could recommend to be used to build uh, a sustainable and inclusive digital economy in this country? Thank you. Rogers Mumelo from uh, Communications Authority, Cyber Security Department. Um, on issues of strategy, <clears throat> we borrow a lot of uh, strategies and policies from International Telecommunications Union. 
So ITU uh, for the last three years have had a financial inclusion uh, global initiative whose main activities were focusing on um, issues surrounding fin digital finance ecosystem. Uh, one of them was to set up a sandbox for checking the security of these digital applications. Another thing was looking at uh, consumers' uh, rights, uh, probably in, in terms of policy and regulation formulation, which advises member countries on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the policies and regulations uh, development process. There's also an issue of the infrastructure security because uh, the whole issue of digital finance is an, is an ecosystem that includes the infrastructure apart from having the service. So such measures as an authority, we, look, we, we actually participate uh, at a regional level and an international level in coming up with uh, the policies and strategies that will uh, empower this uh, sector. Well, thank you so much. Uh, is there any other person with a question? I can see someone behind the other question. Just one, and then uh, we close uh, the session. Uh. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Good afternoon. My name is Evans, representing RDCA. Uh, I had two questions, but my colleague just asked, asked the first question and has been answered. My, my second question was, is about a product, I'm sorry if I, ne I mentioned the name, <coughs> Safaricom. There's a product called Fuliza. Okay, this product is good. It helps some of us, but it's a problem in other hand. For example, I'm a victim. Uh, I send money by accident to a person who had already fulizard the money. So when you call Safaricom, they tell you, ah, oh, that guy just fulizard, so uh, just talk to him if he can just send back your money. So we are talking about pro digital protection of consumers. Uh, I'm sorry, if there's a Safaricom um, <coughs> CEO there, will just answer to, uh, help me with that answer. How are they working on that to protect this person whom we just send uh, money to, the person who has already flizzed, and then they tell you, uh, just talk to him to return, because you're already flizzed, you have no uh, way we can help you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. No, no, welcome that Fuliza thing, Io Fuliza, Madam, since Safaricom are your members, we will, <laughs> we will kindly send you with this message and ask them to come up with a product that is going to protect consumers from such a, a people because I also saw a victim at some point. So kindly uh, take that message to Safaricom because I don't think, but if you can be able to answer on their behalf, I am, I am not, I'm not going to attend. I will not attempt to understand the Fuliza product exactly the way it works, but I've had the question, I've taken note, and I'm going to ask Safaricom to come up with uh, a mechanism that helps you so that even when you send to someone who has full lizard, you can still get your money back. On the same breath, madam, uh, remind Safaricom that those people that are sent money to and cannot be reversed, eh, even one year down the line, you realize that they are still using that same Safaricom line. So remind them to ensure that that is also addressed. Amani Wanaenji. Yes, it has to be addressed. Nimeskia, nita petisha ujumbe, and the next time you see me, ask me. I will have, I'm sure they'll have done something. I'll be after you. I will follow it up. Thank you so much. Okay, now, now na mikono bado. Nani mwingine huya kuna suwale? Kuna dada apale.
Can we have that as the last one? Or if you have a question, just raise up your hand so that, oh, you are two, two, three, four. We have three from here and one from here. Kindly uh, ensure that we get three here and one here, and that will be the end of it. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Lavenda from Director Kesha Kotua. So my question, uh, well, today we've talked so much about data protection, which is a good thing. But then I was also looking at uh, these consumers. What, like, uh, the data is protected, yes, but how, how possible is it for the family members or uh, the next of kin of a consumer to access their data once they are deceased or they are not in a position, like maybe they are sick and they are not able to access things like mobile banking and maybe you need to do transactions or they are dead and uh, you need to follow up on uh, the mobile money that is protected. So how possible is it in as much as the data is protected, how possible is it for the family or next of kin to access this information or data? Okay, next. Okay, thank you. My name is Dan, but mine isn't a question. It's actually a response to the uh, question from our colleague. Actually, after the end of the first session, I engaged Mr. Sitoyo, that is the CEO of M-Pesa, and he assured me that uh, M-Pesa is coming up with a plan that one is if somebody has sent money to a person who has got Fuliza, then that, that, that transaction can be reversed, that is by April. So actually there will be reversal of transactions that are sent to M-Pesa and somebody has, a, has, got, has got a Fuliza account. Wow. So actually there will be reversal of Fuliza transactions. Thank you. I, I think I think I think he should give you a job in that. Okay, next. My name is Alice Otieno. I'm from Kenya Ports Authority. My just a point of adding on to the Mr. Jafat Jafat Ogutu. He mentioned something that he doesn't know how other people can be assisted in the interior, rural, and other people under the interior sessions that they cannot be seen or access the devices to be assisted on problem costs. Maybe, can we put the boots, the way the police officers are surrounded, boots all over the interior points, so that that person who cannot be on our code to do something on his own or our own can get somebody at the booth to assist go to the, through the devices and to assist also for other readings because telephones they're there not only for hearing but also for reading. So can somebody be assigned to assist that common one inchi who might suffer unknowingly? Well, thank you so much. I think we are taking note. And also, Chafeth, I hope you've taken note of that. There was another hand here. Uh, okay. My name is Marilyn Laini, and I really wanted to ask Safaricom, especially those people who have bought shares in Safaricom. Like, for example, you bought your shares in El Fumoja, and then at the end of the year, you're only given a dividend of two shillings, and yet, as we know, all know, that Safaricom in Apata a lot of profit in the whole country compared to any other business. Like, I was just asking, even if you are selling tomato for a whole year, will you get a profit of two shillings? Thank you. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, and that the, before, uh, the, before the end of the year, they come and say, this is the profit before tax. And it goes into millions of billions. My sister, I hear you. And I think uh, the boss is here, is going to take your report at Apeleka. There's one hand here. 
Hi, my name is Fiona. Okay, my name is Fiona, and my question is on cyber security. So you say that I know that there is a responsibility on the consumer side, but then, uh, so nowadays there is a way that we want to pick a survey, we, we create links, uh, we want people to maybe contribute on something, or we are, push, we are pushing for an agenda, we use links. And so some people have taken that advantage to send links that are, uh, give them access to our devices, whether it's the phone or the laptop. So just a month ago, a friend of mine was hacked and all the contact lists that he had, we was, there were messages that were sent to us to send some cash. And everyone ended up sending the cash. By the time we were realizing he's hacked, uh, the person had already withdrawn the money. So I'm just asking, is there a way that uh, maybe the people responsible for cyber security can mitigate uh, this? Thank you. Cyber security, I think you've taken note of that. Uh, one last one, here in front. Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Kamau from Flexcom Enterprises. We are a logistics company dealing with last mile. So my question is directed to Central Bank of Kenya being the regulator for banks. Maybe many people not talk about it, but uh, banks are uh, strangling us with transaction costs on every side. Last year, but one when COVID came, CBK uh, withdrew the transaction charges of transacting money from bank to M-Pesa to mobile, uh, mobile money platforms back and forth. But uh, I don't know if it was taken back, but my bank has been charging us all along. Uh, uh, two weeks ago, people raised the issue on Twitter. The bank said they've withdrawn the charges but I've transacted several since then and they are still charging us. If you walk to a bank and deposit money to your to account, it's free. I don't see why you should charge me 50 bob to do the same through M-Pesa or to withdraw money from M-Pesa, from bank to M-Pesa. Uh, can Central Bank look at that? Thank you. Well, thank you so much and I uh, want to appreciate the audience uh, for being very active. This is your day, as we said, and that's why you've, we've given you this opportunity to ask questions and even give the comments. So in your closing uh, remarks, uh, you'll uh, uh, try to respond to some of the issues that have been raised by the audience, by consumers. Today we are not calling them audience, by consumers. Uh, we'll start from our cyber security guru. Oh, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> thank you also consumers for your patience. So I wanted to just uh, highlight on uh, what our sister Fiona had there said about the Safaricom, uh, the one who had asked about M-Pesa. So also as an association, we have been engaging Safaricom, uh, sorry, uh, the Communications Authority, so that uh, M-Pesa is classified as a critical infrastructure and what he means that it, it is classified almost the same uh, with airports. Uh, because if it goes down for maybe one hour, two hours, there are direct implications in terms of the economy. And uh, right now, M-Pesa is not just a product within Safaricom. They even have their own CEO here. Uh, meaning that they have already started to lay down structures and strategies to be able to make sure that they are always up all the time. So on the question uh, about the, the issue of phishing, because that is phishing, uh, one of the main attack currently uh, is, is phishing. And what do we mean by phishing? And I don't mean phishing of uh, Samaki, PH. So you receive an email with a link Sometimes around Valentine, now we have Ukraine and Russia. 
So you expect a lot of emails coming as updates. And the reason why they are successful is because they work through deception. And also us, as human beings, we easily trust, especially when you see like whatever has been shared on the email is something that you love. So you assume the other person is a genuine person. So what are you supposed to do? So first, I repeat, awareness. So we have this perception that the victims of hacking are the banks. It is only the bank that can be hacked and money stolen and even maybe M-Pesa. But right now, speaking from hackers' perspective, if there's a way that I can get information from each and every person seated here, I will be a very happy person. And that's why I asked how many people are using their birth date under their spouse's name as their passwords. So I already see some very easy targets and very easy people that I can get their information. So when you receive most of these things, one thing is you need to be aware that someone can be setting a wrong thing. When you click something get installed in your phone or in your machine, then your photos, everything is wiped out. So as an association, we, are, we have a solution where when you install that as an app in your phone, so what happens is that any email that comes into your phone, it is scanned without you knowing on the background. So if there are elements of, let's say, like scam, phishing, within the email itself, so you'll be alerted. But the challenge is, the reason why social engineering succeeds, they also uh, take advantage of our desires. Because if you love a certain content, and they send a link with that content, it is highly possible for you to click. So, but there's a way, there's a solution. Also, if you work for companies, if you receive these emails, the best thing is that, you forward such links to the IT departments and they are going to sort out. So, remember, the question is not if you will be hacked. Personally, even sharing this, cyber, wherever. I was hacked 20, 2014. I also sent money, you know, wrongly. Someone just deceived me. I sent almost 25,000. I never got it. So I'm not speaking from a theoretical perspective. I am speaking from a victim and also from a person with experiential knowledge. But you need to be careful. When you receive SMSs, mtu wamekutumia ati, tuma pesa hii pesa kwa hiyo namba ingine. Sometimes, all you, ata mi nisha ituma. Why? Most of the time, so you are expecting to send money to someone. So I sent, I think, around almost 6,000. That is after I sent, I remembered. Oh, I was to... Trying to set that M-Pesa oh, code for reversal, money was gone. I tried to follow up with Safaricom. They told me to go and report to the police. I went to the police. They told me, Wekagari mafuta. So I just gave up on those things. Next, my sister. Utawekagari <laughs> mafuta. That's a good one. <laughs> uh, thank you for this session. Uh, thank you, CA. Thank you, consumers that are here and watching online. Uh, I'll wind up in three sections. I'd like to start with what uh, Zuku does to, to facilitate innovation uh, and, and digital development. I, our, our, what we look at is the entry costs because for anybody to start something, the same way if you're, you want to start a journey, you need bus fare and you even need the vehicle or whatever means you're using, train or something. So we facilitate that entry level uh, for people to be able to access the internet and therefore develop themselves and earn an income or simply enjoy what comes with the internet. What I mean is we have made the entry costs bare minimum. We don't charge uh, for installation for the home internet. We don't charge installation for uh, the satellite TV uh, that's very popular in the villages. Uh, 
including the replacements of the equipment, if uh, something gets damaged, the remote control gets lost, or uh, the modem, the Wi-Fi modem gets damaged, we don't charge our customers uh, for replacements. We do replace free of charge. Uh, secondly, in terms of uh, being on the ground to support our customers who are consumers of our services, we have completely decentralized what is typically known as customer service. So we have the usual 24-7 call center. We are very active online. All the social media platforms, we are there as Zuku. But we also have face-to-face -face interactions in the field, um, largely through our subcontractors and also ourselves directly, where um, Mama in the village can walk to the nearest uh, our whoever is there on our behalf and ask them in language that the two of them understand and that person will ensure that the help has been given. Uh, secondly, in terms of the area of employment, we subcontract a lot of our work. What that does is it makes it possible to work for Wananchi, specifically Zuku in the case of consumer services, by coming through our contractors because they come at a kind of, they, they are able to employ a lot more people uh, and therefore we provide a lot of jobs in this country through our contracted uh, business partners. Also directly as uh, Wananchi, we take interns uh, on three month cycles, uh, fresh from university or during the course of their studies, they can come and work with us in departments depending on uh, their areas of study. Now, going to uh, protection, uh, I can assure the consumers that as Wananchi, we take protection very seriously. For example, even before the data protection uh, uh, agency was set up, we were already very con cognizant of things like somebody can come to us and say, uh, this is my spouse, or this is my child, or this is my sister. Uh, I need to access this and this data about them. We don't do that. The only thing that can make us part with customer information is a court order. So we don't really care who is asking and what is the story behind the asking. We work with the police only, and the police get that information from us by giving us a court order. Uh, secondly, we, uh, I'd like to encourage in terms of what my colleague has talked about awareness, that we also protect ourselves. I'll give certain examples. We, we are receiving very many complaints of uh, innocent customers and we really sympathize. Uh, somebody has been contacted online through Facebook, Twitter, uh, all these platforms, IG, all, all of them, including phone calls, and the person is speaking as if they are Zuku, and ha seems to be knowing so much that the, the person receiving the, the, that uh, communication somehow assumes that it's actually a Zuku person. The, the time they realize they've been conned is when they've already sent money, they are being told this is your monthly subscription, now send it to this number. They send the money or they part with certain information and very quickly, they realize during the course of the month when their due date comes, the service is not working because they've not paid. Oh no, I paid. No, you didn't. Oh, I sent to this number. That is not our pay bill. So the point I'm raising is, please as a consumer, myself and all of us, let's be, let's be aware of, let's be aware and always inquire what are the communication channels with my service provider, whether it's Kenya Power or the water company or an internet provider or at your mobile phone, what are the official channels that you can use to communicate with them so that fraudsters don't take advantage of you at the moment where you actually need to make a payment, as he said. They catch you when you know you're supposed to be paying and they redirect your money to their own pockets for their own use. And you try to follow up with them, you can't find them. And what has come out common is sending money to a mobile phone number. Most of us service providers have either a till or a pay bill. 
So don't divert your money to a mobile number. Secondly, in terms of talking to people, uh, check and save on your phone which is the right number, which is the right email, which is the right Twitter handle and Facebook page for your service provider. Otherwise, you will find, you, like, you can actually go online and find a, a fake Twitter handle that is branded Zuku. And if you are just going with the name Zuku, you will engage that person and they will call you. So let's be aware as a CEA and uh, data protection are protecting you as consumers, also raise your level of awareness. The same way we were so scared of COVID, we were not greeting one another, we would not be sitting here together. So let's not entertain the fraudsters by not being aware of basic things about your many, many service providers. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. I, uh, the takeaways from there that when we are communicating, we should use a language that a consumer can understand. That's number one. And then number two, awareness has come on board. So those who are tasked with this again, we need to take uh, awareness seriously so that consumers can know what to do. So for the rest of us, if we could take each two minutes, it will serve us well uh, so that uh, we can uh, wind up. But if you have something more, it's still okay. Welcome, my brother. And now I'm going to take the Zuku one. I was really scared, eh? but now I, I, I will be a, sub, a consumer. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, from JTL, for us, uh, we value the customer. So in terms of the things that we do, you realize that uh, if your customer loses trust in you, then they'll not be there for, to do business with you tomorrow. So everything that we do in terms of uh, either the service that we are giving you or enabling, keeping you aware, we try to push that information uh, to you. But um, listening to some of the questions, I think um, I still have the, the issue that the governor raised this morning. That uh, what
the deal is too good, then most of the time you need to question it. So if someone says you tell me they're going to give you money from Nigeria, uh, I think uh, you need to question yourself and uh, uh, apply yourself to the truth with them that you have. Thank you. Next, madam. Thank you. 
your money is safely guarded within a bank. And that's why it's important for you, even as you download these apps and these money transfer services, that you make sure you're doing it in an entity that is licensed. And the third point, the detriment is then that the bank is charging you to make money from the bank. The wallet identity is still there. You can still do it with this method. Make sure you see her. Okay, uh, Madam Fiona, in uh, one minute. You gave everyone two. I'll take two. <laughs> All right. Uh, allow me to just start by um, recognizing the fact that within the country there is a digital economy strategy document that sits with the Ministry of ICT, which the central bank adapted and has been aligning to as they develop and launch the different uh, policy documents and regulations. And within that document under digital business, there is one of the pillars that talks about the protection of the consumers. So the protection of the consumers is critical to everybody involved within the digital economy. And that said and done, I have to, uh, just for the purposes of putting the record straight, state that the reason when you call a customer service number is because most of the service providers use call centers and there are global standards and best practices that the call centers use and adapt to and align to even be able to be recognized and to receive business from international companies. One of them is to have a level of automation so that when you call and you're guided what key to press is part of those standards. It cannot be done away with. It is a requirement. What we need is to educate our consumers and help them understand the importance of listening keenly and following the process. Because if we don't do have those in place, there's a level of global uh, outsourcing services that the country gets denied. And we are trying to grow an entire ICT sector. So let's think holistically. And let's realize that as Kenya grows, we are ahead in many things. Kenya is likely to be an ICT hub. And therefore, if we become a digital hub for the re region, what does that mean? It means a lot of things that we do, because we are moving very fast with global standards and things that touch on global standards. And we have got a, a regulator within ICT who is extremely involved in the global level and is involved within the ITU, part of developing all this. So let's appreciate what we have and work on educating the customer. You'll notice that in the more recent months especially, even Safaricom began to automate. Why? Because as they go global, there are standards that have to be met. And so while we are wanting to have our very Kenyan way of doing things, tunapenda kuonana, kusikilizana, kusikia ni mutu ni meongea na yeye, kwa sababu iyo ni hali yetu. Let us try and see also how that hardly of ours can be a challenge for us to become a regional giant and powerhouse. Do we want to become a regional giant and powerhouse in what we do, especially when we go digital? Where, from where I sit, yes, because I've been a driver of that. And so uh, my closing remarks for all of us today is that as we uh, come to the end of the day, Remember, at the end of the day, it is what you know and what you share in your circles helps everybody become aware of what is going on. Basically, I'm asking, can you not just have sat here for yourself, but for others? So let us use word of mouth. You have mumeskiza, mumeambiwa, na kila mtu ni mwona alikuwa na mdomo especially wakati wa kukula. Sasa wakati wa kuongea, tafadhalini, muende kwenye vikundi vyenu in the different groups you are in, with its WhatsApp groups, Instagram groups, YouTube groups, whatever it is that you like to engage with your peers, with your friends. Share the information with them. Help them to be aware of what is going on, of what is happening, of what their rights are. Because an empowered consumer is of more value to service com providers than a consumer who doesn't know what they are entitled to. So read also the agreements that you sign and be make sure you're clear on them. Please be clear on them and negotiate 
if you feel you can negotiate, because sometimes service providers are very liberal. Come out here, and uh, basically JTL and Zuku are just a few of those that are present, but they normally will negotiate if there's something you're not comfortable with. The challenge with us, and we have to be honest to ourselves as Kenyans, is we look at the package, we take because our friend has taken, we didn't understand the terms, we didn't know what they were looking for. My needs and your needs may be different as consumers. I've not negotiated my needs, you negotiated yours. I want, I just go in. Sisi ni kama wala watu anauzanga nyanya kwa vile mtu amuza na ametengeneza pesa, tunenda, tunachukua yetu, tuneka next, na tunataka pia sisi tukue millionaires. We can't, we can't all move that way. So we need to really incapac basically capacitate ourselves and ingrain within ourselves the habit and the culture of being keen consumers. And that is what will build the trust. That is, and where there is trust between you and your service provider, you'll find you understand your service provider better and your service provider will understand you better as a consumer and always innovate around your needs because your needs will be clear to the service provider. If we agree on that with any service provider, whether a co-digital, whether ni banks, whether ni nini, whichever service provider, you'll find that we will end up with better products, more innovation happening in our space. Because I believe Kenyans are very intelligent people and that is why we are very quick to adapt ICT. We are one of the fastest countries that adapts ICT in this continent. Why is that happening? Because we love new things. We love to try out. We love to experiment. We love to just have a different experience. Can we use that knowledge and bring it back to service providers and tell them, this product you're giving me, we want a change. Nimeskia complaints on Safaricom. I've promised I will pass the message and we will make sure that this that I am saying is going to happen. Ata mimi nitenda nifungue mdomo na niwaambie lazima tubadilike na tufanya mambo njia tafauti so that we can see better results and we can have consumers who are happy. We may not fulfill your needs 100%, but I believe if we are able to improve, to come up to 80%, 90%, that range, we'll have done ourselves a good job. And when we sit next year, we can have another review and another conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, fellow panelists. Wow, 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 wow. Thank you so much. Uh, what a way to end this. Um, two things. Kila mtu aenda fungwe nini? Mdomo. Ayambie mwenzake. Na sisi tunapenda kusalimiana, tujaribu sana, tuende global. Niyo ni maneno tumesikia kutoka kwa dada yetu. Uh, I've been, thank you so much panelists. Thank you CA for this uh, opportunity to be here to talk to consumers and also to celebrate consumer, the, uh, the World Consumer Rights Day. I've uh, been your moderator, Alice Kemuto, Director Consumer Grassroots Association. And maybe if you want to know more about uh, Consumer Grassroots Association, CGA, I think we are an organization with the largest number of consumers uh, registered as uh, individual members, over 130,000 in this country. And we also welcome you to join us. You can call us on 0705-69000 and we'll be able to have a conversation because we want uh, to have as many consumers from the grassroots as possible. Yule mama alisema kwamba kuna mama ako pale ndani kabisa wesi fikiwa, sisi tutaeza fika. Kwa sababu ya mda, tumeshukuru sana. It was a bit hot, but now it's a bit cold. And I think Mr. Oro wants to take us to another level. We want to thank you so, so much. Can we have a round of applause as they stand up for a photo? As they stand up for a photo. And I would like you to help me because this is our birthday as consumer organizations. Please, in the count of three, you just say today is the World Consumer Rights Day. Kindly help me to do that. And those with cameras, you can roll them around uh, behind there. So in one, two, and three, World Consumer Rights Day. How can we speak louder than you? I would like to hear you just like a chorus in church. In the count of three, one, two, three. World Consumer Rights Day. Thank you so much.
You can clap for them as they take a photo. This is the only session that we had many ladies than the other ones. We won't 